Good afternoon. Welcome to our series 2021 Philosophers, dedicated to thinkers who will reshape the landscape of contemporary philosophy. Today, my guest is a well-known French philosopher, Frédéric Worms, professor at the École Normale Supérieure de Paris. He's also its deputy director of humanities. Frédéric has dedicated his first works to Henri Bergson, of which he became a, the specialist and editor. He's a, a great historian of philosophy, but he has also built his own thinking and has written a dozen of books. His recent work deal with questions of ethics and politics, issues of human rights, care, and violence. Among many other books, Revivre, Éprouver nos blessures et nos ressources is one of my favorites. And the most recent are Pour un humanisme vital, published by Odile Jacob in 2019. And, well, I think it's releasing uh, today or tomorrow. <laughs> it's very fresh. Uh, Vivre en temps réel, uh, published by Bayard. Frédéric is a committed thinker in the public humanities, a member of the Comité Consultatif National d'Ethique. He is also a radio producer at France Culture and a columnist for the newspaper Libération. He will give a talk about uh, 30, 40 minutes, and you can ask him your questions thanks to the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. This meeting will be recorded and you can watch it later on our YouTube channel. Frédéric, welcome to the Maison Française of NYU. Merci, uh, François. Merci à la Maison Française. Uh, this will all be my only words in French. I, I'm mm -hmm. going to try and speak English uh, to you and with you. And I'm very happy to be in New York, um, even uh, virtually. I would, love, of course, <laughs> prefer to be present, uh, as, was, uh, as was anticipated last fall. But of course, we, we are not totally absent, and um, we are keeping in touch, as we could say. So I'm very happy and honored to be part of this series uh, in, uh, on uh, French philosophy in, uh, in the present time. And um, I would like to, to try, as uh, Francois generously invited me uh, um, to do, uh, to, to, to sketch a sort of uh, logic of uh, the diversity of questions I, uh, I am uh, trying to deal with. And um, to, to show you some, uh, some unity, starting with uh, the basic, um, to me, the, ba the basic, the, the central idea of, um, of uh, what I try to, to do in philosophy and to, to show uh, how it is central to uh, contemporary life and history and philosophy. I will start with um, the, the book that uh, Francois just uh, said was going to be published uh, these, these hours, I would say, it will be in the French bookstores uh, tomorrow. It was just issued. I was just uh, with the publisher th this morning. And I, it's not for a narcissistic or um, commercial uh, advertising uh, reason uh, that I want to start with this, but it's for a translation uh, purpose that will lead me to the core problem I want to, to discuss with you today. So I will sh share very briefly the, the cover of the book and, and try to, to, to start with the translation question of the title, to show you the, the core contradiction that to me is the basic principle of human life. Um, okay, the, I think you see the, 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 the cover of the book. So um, uh, the, the title is, as Francois told you, is uh, in French, Vivre en temps réel. And the, the image is to me a subtitle. It's of course, the idea is that I'm dealing with a, a general um, a question in human life, but it has a specific uh, uh, relevance to the, the event we are living today, which is the pandemic. And of course, so, and through the pandemic, through all our history. So, I, and I want to, to start with, um, with the question of translating this phrase, vivre en temps réel. Um, I just checked over internet and I, I, I knew and I, I, it was confirmed to me that we could translate it uh, very uh, literally by saying uh, living in real time. Uh, 
I think in real time is a is a phrase that that correctly uh, translates and that's the equivalent of the French uh, en temps réel, which means, uh, of course, that the, we live an event with the con consciousness of the time of the event itself taking place while we are living it. But of course, there is another possible translation. And the other possible translation is the very, um, in English, uh, probably would, uh, would, would lead us very directly to the question that's at the center of my, my work and uh, my, my proposition, so to, so to speak. And, and by the way, the, the English word I am going to use is also now, of course, very present in French. So it's, it, could have, it could also have been, in a way, a, a French title. I think the, the best way to translate the title if the book was to be translated, would be something like living live. Living live because, of course, en temps réel is actually in English best rendered by live on the screens of our um, TV sets or um, computers or, or iPhones or whatever. And of course, what I want to say, and of course, we could also use the, the use is now very, the word is, um, is uh, very uh, well used in France, of course, on, on our screens, we can see en direct, we never see en temps réel, although we, we see, we say that and we think uh, probably that, but we, um, we can see live and live means en temps réel. It means that the, the image you are seeing, the, 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 the sentences, the, 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 the acts you are witnessing are taking place en temps réel. The, in the real, the very time you are looking at it is also the time of the event and the consciousness of this time is very present to you. But what is the contradiction? Um, living life, should be something like a tautology. We, we, of course, we are living our life. So we are living our life en temps réel. We are living our life live, so to speak. But of course we don't, because usually we live our life without thinking about the time we are living it, uh, we are living it in, and without uh, the consciousness of the time we are um, living uh, our lives in, uh, in uh, en temps réel. To the contrary, I think the experience of living life, living an event en temps réel, living our life with the consciousness of living it live as it occurs, in the time it occurs, is very exceptional in our lives. It is dedicated to events that are mainly, that are exceptional and that are mainly occurring not only to us, but to others, and most of the time negatively as a catastrophe, for example, a terrorist attack. The people who witnessed the, the Twin Towers uh, planes and uh, they, some, some of them filmed that with the cameras, also the people who, who were witnessing uh, uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy assassination in Dallas, they were saying, I witnessed it, I, I lived it live, but that was exceptional and that was negative and that was a pain. And so the, the basic um, uh, idea I want to, to develop today, tonight in France, we are, we are live, but we are with, a, <laughs> of course, a, a, a time difference. That's also an interesting phenomenon. Um, the basic um, uh, idea I want to develop with you and show you how it leads me to, uh, as Francois said that uh, to, through a personal attempt, but also a historical perspective and a, a sort of um, contemporary intervention is to, 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 to say and to, and to see that, uh, in fact, this phrase living life shows us the contradiction in human life, not a tautology, but a contradiction, a contradiction that has a very specific uh, uh, time aspect, which to me is the fact of living in time without thinking about it and living on the contrary, a conscious relationship to time that can destroy our life. And I, and I will get back to this, to this point at the end of my talk, going back to the pandemic. But um, I want to start with the, the, the contradiction that, that behind the, the, the apparent tautology and to show you that it leads to what I, the, the, to a, a, a possible uh, principle in philosophy, the principle which to me is at the core of um, 
if I was to, to name it the position I develop, I name it in uh, French or in English um, as a critical vitalism. Uh, vitalisme critique is the position I defend, which also leads to a vital humanism, which is the title of the book uh, Francois referred to. To me, it's quite synonymous. I will, I will say why in a second. So what, what is critical vitalism? Critical vitalism is the position that uh, states as any vitalism that life is the ultimate uh, reality, not a kind of reality that's reducible to any other one, like uh, for example, to uh, inert uh, mechanisms or to uh, a conscious uh, mind or a transcendent mind, but it is a bit more precise. And the first um, uh, tenet of uh, critical vitalism is that life doesn't exist as such, but only as opposed to something negative, which is uh, basically death or anything negative, such as uh, uh, <clears throat> illnesses, uh, diseases, uh, the pathological in general, just as Georges Canguillem, which who is a master of critical vitalism to me, said that uh, life is uh, defined by the opposition to something negative. And of course, uh, to me, uh, the fact that uh, we live without thinking about life, but when we have a problem, we, we, we think about life and death, and it occurs to us as a negative phenomenon, and, and especially as far as time goes with this phrase, live, en direct, en temps réel, which to me is, as any explicit consciousness of time, a negative phenomenon, a ph phenomenon related to the fight against negativity. And to me, the fact of li the, the phrase I started with, living life, vivre en temps réel, is not a, an obvious tautology, but uh, the sign of an intimate contradiction. The fact, this, the fact that we, we suddenly realize that we live, a, 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 we live, a, we live as, um, uh, we live always through an opposition to what's, uh, what's against um, the fact of our, of our life. And the, Consciousness of time is to me the ultimate, uh, the ultimate sign of that, and it's of course very present in the current pandemic, in the current negative, global negative, and vit critically vital event, of course, uh, that we that we uh, experience. And so that's the first uh, aspect of critical vitalism. The second aspect is also very much present in um, in uh, living life. In, uh, in, um, it's the, the fact that this basic polarity of life, this basic polarity of life, that's the ultimate fact of um, anything to me, so to speak. And uh, of course, it's a, it's a major uh, tenet, but um, uh, it's not, I'm not going to try and demonstrate it altogether. The second aspect of critical vitalism is that, of course, this polarity is unevenly distributed through the different living beings. And for some human, for some living beings, and uh, especially uh, human beings, which are living beings all, all through their our lives, their lives, but uh, but of course they are not cut from the other living beings by a by a sort of barrier, but for, through some specificities and intensities of polarity and and more dangers than uh, than the other living beings. Uh, this, this fact of um, the polarity between life and death takes both a conscious and a relational um, form. So, the, so we have to, to think that, uh, to me, the second tenet of critical vitalism is to distinguish between living beings. Living beings, living, life is not only negative and active, it's a difference. Between, between beings and human beings, one of the signs we have is that they take con they conscious, they have a conscious relationship to the negativity. And also they have a relational dimension of negativity. We can be destroyed, not so, we can, to live we need some uh, vital relationships and we can be destroyed by them just as the polarity of life and death occurs in, an, in our life. So, and living life, shows us that the consciousness, the psychic dimension of life is central to human life and negativity is, is deep into the, the, the psychic dimensions of all living beings probably, but, and we have to, to, to know what kind of specificity there is to human life in this, uh, in this uh, direction. And of course, there is a third specificity is that the fact that uh, uh, life in, um, 
in a human uh, context is always social and political and that we attain life only from um, from a human conscious and social and political uh, dimension the political dimension of life is not only negative though of course it, it can be negative it can be destructive and of course living life can be a manipulation it seems immediate but of course live on tv sets it's also uh, an advertising and also a power on our life. It, it uses the fascination of the, of the danger and of time and for political reasons. And of course, we can also, also suspect the reality of the life. Are we really witnessing what we are witnessing? Someone is showing it to us. Life is also an instrument of power, but it's live, I mean, <laughs> en direct. And of course, it can be also a, a way of support. We need to be informed. We need to be so. So, uh, to me, politics are polarized between uh, a, a negative dimension and also a positive dimension. Which is why, also, I think that we have to not only to criticize the human political relationship to life, as uh, some French philosophers do, through the dimension of biopower or biopolitics. But we, we are not to be naive either, to think that we are guided by a sort of moral um, disposition. And um, if I work on uh, care, as uh, Francois mentioned it, it's not only as a natural positive dimension uh, derivated from life and, uh, and that, would, that would push us towards the other and to, toward helping because we need to be helped, which we, we are helped. It's not the case, it's, it's, there is a polarity so to me, critical vitalism is a philosophy that develops the polarity of life through the different living beings and through the specifically moral political set of uh, human activities. So that's the basic tenet of the, of the philosophy I defend. And of course, you can see that it's, um, that it's sort of confirmed by the pandemic we are living in pandemic is reminding us that we are living beings confronting uh, uh, the dangers of, uh, of life. It's also reminding us that there is a psychic dimension and it's the dimension of time I will go back to in the end. And of course it is a political event and it's reviving the political dangers of human life as, as such. But before going back to the pandemic as a um, specific event, I want to, to do two um, two historical um, historical um, remarks uh, more generally and of course i won't be able to to uh, demonstrate all the, the the things i want to just sketch and sort of draw the figure of the uh, of the philosophy of life i'm defending on this very simple thing that living life is a contradiction uh, the the pandemic, first I will start with one historical aspect of the pandemic, not as such, so to speak, not only as the coronavirus uh, pandemic. To me, the pandemic is uh, only one part of a um, historical sequence that I call the philosophical moment that's defined by the philosophical problem of life, uh, starting with, um, uh, starting probably, a, to me, at least in France, 30 years ago. To me, the history, history of philosophy as such is defined by specific and distinct and discontinuous moments defined by uh, a problem that, um, that uh, takes place, that replaces another one and makes something of a, of a convergence of um, not only some, but potentially all dimensions of philosophy. And to me, in the 20th century in philosophy, and at least in French philosophy, but more globally, it can be distinguished in, in four major moments. And we enter the moment of the living, the moment I call le moment du vivant, the moment also of care and the moment uh, of biopolitics in a way, and biopolitics were defined by Michel Foucault in the turn of the 80s, when precisely the, the, the human knowledge the human life, the human knowledge was defined in terms of life through the brain and not, not anymore in terms of uh, linguistic uh, social structure and historical structure. The, the ethics and politics of men was, were defined by, um, 
uh, biological uh, dangers and biopolitical powers and, uh, and the pandemic and the climate change are, but not only them are, are the signs of that. And, um, and also science was as the, the basic of it for me, a philosophic, philosophical moment is defined by new scientific problems and giving the core to a more general approach of uh, mankind. And of course, to me, the pandemic is only the crystallization of the moment of, of the living, the moment of life in human history and the human philosophy, science and politics. It's not, it's an event that has something absolutely new, but also something absolutely predictable and something that will not stop. There is this con controversy in France, I'm sure you, you have the same in the US, saying that, of course, some people say it's an event, so there is an before and an after. But of course, many people say there is no, there will not be an after because we will stay in the pandemic, which is my thesis, of course, in Vivre en temps réel. But I can say there is, there, there is not on, only no after, but there is no before either. There is no before the pandemic. The before was already sort of pandemic because we were already living in a global living world where the definition of man with the animal and global life and the global history was and planetary history was our new condition with a, 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 the consciousness of it being more negative than positive potentially to me the, the negative is not, not only negative of course the negative is only negative for a living being that fights against it so it's negative only for positive action of course to to take to take place and we have to fight all the dangers of uh, of life and of course as i said um the dangers of life for human beings are not only vital in a in a biological sense they are vital in a psychic and a political sense that's what i call vital humanism is the same as critical vitalism because to fight the dangers, we have to, to first to fight the political dangers and then the biological dangers there. They are, all, the, all of them are vital, but there is a sort of weird priority of, of, uh, of injustice over, over uh, other vital dangers that, that are that is the scope of my, of my uh, the, this really the, the paradox of critical vitalism in a way. And um, I have a discussion, an ongoing discussion with many philosophers on, on this subject, but in the US, uh, for example, with uh, Judith Butler, and in, in one month we have a discussion that we had in Paris called On the Livable and the Unlivable that's going to be also published with the PUF, and the, it's one of part of this discussion, but I, I, I don't want to make too many digression, digressions, and, uh, and um, I want to, to finish the, the, the sketch I'm just uh, drawing for you, for you, and I want to have some time for the discussion. So, so the, there is this basic hypothesis I have in the history of philosophy that uh, it, it is composed of uh, specific and discontinuous moments defined by problems. And of course, uh, to me, critical vitalism is only one of the positions in the moment of the living, and there are others. You have people um, uh, like, for example, the cognitive scientist who reduces to, to living beings. You have people that um, think that we are not, um, we are, we are, that life is a political construction and, and so forth. The second historical point I want to make is, of course, uh, a, can, can be taken to, tonight from a retrospective uh, position, but to me was more of a, more of a prospective uh, uh, progress. But in fact, I think I, I, I started with um, the retrospective way in, from the beginning in, my, in, in fact. The, the, it's very simple to state is that critical vitalism to me is not of course an invention. It's of course central in, in the current moment that we are living through, but it has a, a great history in philosophy. It goes back to the Greeks, to me, the, 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 you know, Jean Val, the French philosopher said that every philosophy has a pre-Socratic ancestor. <laughs> and some of them are Parmenides, the others are Heracliteans. And, and of course, I'm an Empedoclean, building the whole world, the whole universe with love and hate and period. And that's my case. 
I used to say once, I, I'm a dualist, but not between body and soul, but between life and death, and between uh, love and hate, in a way. And the Freudian, um, and Freud also said that the his predecessor was Empedocles, which is uh, my case too. We have the same uh, origins. And um, of course, uh, retrospectively, I tend to 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 see a, a tradition of critical vitalism. And to me, the the, the greatest uh, theoretician of critical vitalism in the French 20th century philosophy is Georges Canguilhem. But of course, I defend the idea in in um, uh, in the French history, French philosophy history, that uh, for example, Bergson is a critical vitalist, which is not obvious for everybody, and and it's understandable because Bergson could be thought of as a metaphysical vitalist. What I call a metaphysical vitalist is someone for whom life is a, an essence, a positive essence, and not, not uh, uh, active polarity with, in front of a negativity. And so with the élan vital, with the duration, uh, Bergson seems to be more on the side of Schopenhauer, for example, uh, or others, uh, um, uh, uh, metaphysical substantialist uh, vitalist, which is to me not the case. Because what's important in Bergson is not only duration, but the opposition between duration and space, between profound time and time as necessary for our action, and then you can see again living life. Bergson would have understood, of course, that life is the time of the clock. And the clock is the time for vital action and not for vital creation and vital uh, pure pure time, which is um, creative and, and tacit and not explicitly counted. So Bergson, of course, is a critical vitalist to me. And of course, Bergson would explain the contradiction in the phrase living life. <laughs> Vivre life could be the title of my book. <laughs> and of course, uh, to me, Bergson is a critical vitalist up to his ethics and politics with the opposition between the closed and the open societies that he even in, invented. But it can be disputed and it can be disputed also, for example, on cases like uh, Nietzsche. Some people think he's a critical vitalist, which I don't think in a way, but he's a complicated vitalist, I would say. But it's, it's not also, a, there is not life with a capital L, but there is a refusal of the polarity of um, not only good and evil, but even um, pain and pleasure and, uh, and life and death. So, so we have to build back a tradition of critical vitalism. We have to assume a retrospective look at the history of philosophy. And for example, Freud and Canguilhem are major critical vitalists, of course, and, and they inspire me very much. So, so in fact, if you, my work can, could be seen, of course, the other way around. I started with, uh, as Francois very generously said, I started with, um, with a uh, history of philosophy with Bergson, then I developed it in a theory of the moments of uh, history of philosophy. And then I came to the present moment with the moment of life and I would have developed a philosophy of life of my own, which is in, in a sense, although very pretentious, it's, it's kind of the case. But in fact, it was all together for me. And it's, um, I think I started with a critical vitalist uh, uh, demand in a way with from personal experiences, of course. And I think, of course, and I will end with this, that um, philosophy is always a, a way of explicitizing uh, a major affirmation or a major refusal, of course. And it took me a while to, to come from the refusal to the affirmation, of course, the refusal of the negativity in life and in human life and politics to the affirmation of uh, philosophy behind that. And um, it is true that alongside with the uh, historical um, uh, um, diagnosed hypothesis that I stated, alongside with the, um, the, the construction of um, uh, critical vitalism and uh, human, vi human um, vital humanism in a way, um, I, I tried to solve, uh, uh, I would say, metaphysical and also um, ethical and, um, and philosophical problems as such. This is the attempt behind my um, uh, 
reflection on uh, on care, le soin in French. The, it's an interesting controversy between soin and care in French philosophy. But to me, the controversy is what's interesting in it is that what's common between the terms. They are very different. Care in American thinking and soin in French thinking are very different. But there's one thing in common. It's that they go from the vital to the political from different ways. Soin in French is more medical. Care is more social and moral, but, but they're both vital and ethical. And of course, I, I, I tried to think over um, what to me are primitive major experiences in human life, such as revivre. And uh, Francois mentioned that. And to me, revivre has two meanings, of course, because I am also always uh, divided in a, in a polarity. Revivre or relive, also very difficult to translate, is both a positive experience when we uh, start again, and also a negative experience when we repeat endlessly. And of course, I, then it was followed for me by a book which is called Penser à quelqu'un, thinking of someone, thinking about someone, which to me is a primitive uh, human experience, the vital relationships being prior to objective uh, thinking. And some, of, some others that I won't uh, develop, but then now I am uh, at the crossroads of the moment with two kinds of interventions, of course. I have uh, some interventions in the in the time of the in the time being, of course, with the, trying to put some uh, philosophical perspective and a historical and critical uh, approach, and um, that's why I'm involved in a in a chronic in a in a uh, how did you say, uh, François? Uh, uh, how do you translate a tri uh, regular Tribune or a regular paper, monthly paper in Liberation and uh, yeah, you're, you're a columnist? Right, columnist, yeah, with on, a, on a monthly basis. And also I, I, I try to, to have some, uh, some sort of chronicling the present in a way. And um, also, of course, uh, the, the, the last book, the, the book just, uh, and last year I just published um, a collection of uh, five years of, uh, five of the years of my uh, chronicles uh, and tribunes in uh, Liberation under the title uh, Sideration and Resistance. And, and the book I just published, uh, Vivre en temps réel, is a small book uh, on an apparently local experience. The fact that we, um, we, we sometimes have the explicit consciousness of time bounding at us like a beast. And, and being very dangerous, but on very specific events. And now it's the condition that we live under the threat of climatic change and um, pandemic. And of course, it's a very small book, but to me, as you can understand, it sums up all the directions I just sketched. It's also a discussion with Bergson, of course, stressing the negativity of uh, the real time and vital time, as much as the positivity of creation and um, and and uh, duration, but it's also, um, and it's implicit, of course, Bergson is present, but very discreetly. And it's also, um, of course, a discussion of the moment of the living. And it's also, of course, a def defense of critical vitalism ending up in the, in the defense of what we call in French sanitary democracy and public health policies. I'm currently teaching a class on public health and I'm also one of the, people in charge at the French National Ethics Committee with the uh, first the first um, um, position of the committee on public health and of course we have we have made some uh, position public some position during the pandemic that we could develop in the discussion so this but but I want to end with the fact that uh, the question of time is not secondary of course to me life is uh, of course, temporal in its essence, since it can stop. Life is not a, a state of being, it's a continuation, threatened by an interruption. And so life is, a, of course, a, a matter of time as such. And of course, time is, is vital. Time is vital in two ways. Time is vital in, in the way that it belongs to life and also by the way that it's itself polarized. Some, some, some experiences of time are sufferings as such and it starts with the very littlest degrees like for example boredom 
I hope you are not experiencing it right now. <laughs> uh, up until the very negative experience of despair, for example, or of uh, panic or uh, under emergencies and the question of emergencies at the core of what we live and also the manipulations of the life system. And of course, in the US and in France, you, you know very well how the, the, the fascination of the life can be a destructive power. And so that's why <clears throat> living life is not um, an obvious tautology as it seems, but uh, to me can, can sum up the contradictions, the dangers, but also the, the resource of, um, of our condition. That's what I wanted to offer you tonight and propose and, and, and also to be discussed and uh, pretty Thank sad. you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Frédéric. So now it's time for a question. And uh, well, uh, we have already uh, one question, but uh, <laughs> I will start uh, our, the conversation. And um, so Frédéric, you, you have uh, highlighted the notion of moment, moment um, in, in the history of philosophy such as Le Moment 1900 and the moments of, uh, so uh, the, the, the nine, 1900. And uh, you just point out that the living moments or the moment of the living. Hmm? And uh, I'm struck by the, the, the absence in your discourse of the word existence, which allowed, which allowed philosophers to, uh, to make a difference with the, with the, the, the positive natural life. And so do you consider that today uh, the notion of existence uh, became an old fashioned word in the time of the living? Oh, we, you, you got to- You will be shocked. Yeah. I was sorry, I, I just uh, activated my, my microphone. You will be shocked uh, Francois because I will partly say yes because the, the, what I call the moment of existence is of course the moment of existentialism. And to me, existence was built up not only by Heidegger and even Sartre, as you know better than anyone, but also by people like Politzer before Heidegger and others. And, uh, and, and it was a way, uh, the way Politzer as a critical of Bergson and Heidegger later and Sartre and Merleau-Ponty and Ricoeur and Levinas sort of existence, it was precisely as opposed to life. And the very fact that for Heidegger, death is not a biological fact. Death is the possibility that we refer to as the possibility of nothingness, which makes us unliving beings, but existential beings. And for example, uh, for Sartre, of course, it's the possibility of liberty, even in imagination, showing that we are not only beings, we are nothingnesses that shows that we are existing beings with existing beings, meaning not things, not bodies, not life, not anything, nothing. Okay, that's existing and that's the grandeur of existence and of existentialism starting with Kierkegaard and so forth. And, and uh, I, I am a great admirer of existent, philosophies of existence. But I think of course, that there is a big debate between existence and life and I'm on the side of life. I'm on the side of life as opposed to, to death, as building some individual subjectivities in uh, complex relationships, but all this being, being a matter of life and death, all through existence. There is a danger with the concept of existence when you cut it from life. And this danger, of course, Heidegger is the great, the great proof of the danger because Heidegger thought that to get through existence, you have to deny the, the, the primacy of life as, a, as opposed to, to death. And people who would deal with life would be only dealing with the, you know, the beings, but not with being, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm on the side of living beings. And of course, uh, there is a place for individual subjectivity. There is a place for the questions. There is a place we, we have an access to the question of existence. But the, this, I will end with the sign of that, that it's a, it's a vital question. It's the question of existence can be a support or can be a destruction. It can be vital or mortal. So, so yes, I think, I think for better or for worse, 
uh, we are beyond the question of existence and we are we are driven back to life and death. Uh, Frédéric, you, you, you worked on an author, Bergson, who was not very fashionable uh, at the time, at the end of the 20th century, while others were scholars were working on Foucault, Deleuze, Derrida. C can you explain your choice at this time? Uh, and well, in a way, speaking of critical vitalism, is it uh, a kind of, <laughs> for you, Bergson's revenge or Bergson's return today? Partially because, of course, uh, there are many Bergsonisms and um, as many as the great philosophies always have. And as I said, maybe um, um, uh, Bergson would have uh, stated him, put, thought of himself more as a spiritualist than a vitalist mm -hmm. and, and especially as a critical vitalist. Yeah. Um, and because for him, life was a psychological process and he had the view and the essence of life, which I don't know where I don't try to, even to look at. I mean, there, to me, there is nothing beyond uh, the, the fact of life uh, as a fact fighting uh, uh, against death. But of course, yes, I think, um, I think between philosophical moments, there are great uh, uh, ruptures and, and discontinuities. And I think the, the, the existence uh, quarrel against Bergson was excessive and unjust and also falsified some problems, falsified the reading of Bergson. You always carry caricature the, the people you want to parry, to make the parricide against. And of course, um, and of course I, I wanted to rehabilitate uh, Bergson, but I think also Freud in a way. Freud was driven through Lacan, Ricoeur, Sartre and uh, others through existence, for example, when Sartre did what he called existential psychoanalysis but of course Freud is a vitalist so, so it's, the, it's <laughs> of course there is misunderstandings in the history of philosophy yeah. what I and and Bergson was the victim also of uh, many of those misunderstandings the the, the the rupture also with analytic philosophy is very very deep and uh, to me very dangerous as a rupture we can we have to build back the relationships he had with um, uh, philosophy of language of his time and so forth. So, so yes, I wanted to rebuild a, a sort of um, complete history of the 20th century, what I suspected, but didn't have, it took me time to, to get back to is that it's not the revenge of Bergson, it's the revenge of the question of, uh, of life. And, and I didn't anticipate such a revenge of the question of life on us. Uh, what I fear is that the moment of life will will become the moment of death, that the, the vital philosophy will become a, a mortal period for, for us. I think Bergson is also an antidote in the sense that uh, he will never let us be only uh, negative. Mm -hmm. He will remind us also the positive aspect of life, which, which is true because, and Canguilhem was uh, very Bergsonian in that sense. That of course, we fight against the negative, but it's, it shows us that the negative can only be thought of as also with also something opposed to it. Mm -hmm. So I, I always discover new things in Bergson. I, I just wrote a short paper Bergson in his time, which is, which is totally new to me. Okay, so I have uh, some more question, but about the, well, the, 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 the influence of uh, the French uh, thought or the, the polemics between the US and, uh, and, and France today. But first of all, I have a question from the audience, uh, <clears throat> from uh, Sabrina Bovali. Uh, it's in French. Uh, pour Nietzsche, il semble que l'absurde est de ne pas vivre dans le présent, aussi vivre dans le présent en temps réel, Est-ce pour vous un moyen de combattre l'absurde? Yes, <laughs> I think uh, that, that's that's totally true. I think um, I think uh, the present time is uh, is real and uh, is also a remedy against despair, against the ab abstract questions that lead us to nihilism and to despair. What's the meaning of it all? When you when you are in pain, where you don't uh, really. Um, you don't really uh, ask such questions. Maybe the effect of pain can be despair and can be destructing. 
also our, our minds, but um, and, and um, despair and madness are real vital possibility, of course. But um, yes, I think uh, living in the present, but in two meanings. To me, there are two mistakes, of course. If you think of the present only as the vital danger, it's, uh, it, it can lead you to despair and you, you can be reduced to that. But as opposed to that, there is a tendency and I think it's, it might be present in Nietzsche, but it's present in um, antique philosophy. It's present in French, for example, with uh, someone who is not Nietzschean and proud of it. And I let, it, let that to him, that's uh, Consponville, for example. People who say, live, live, vivre dans le présent, live in the present is to be in pure time, pure presence, no danger, no, well, no, sorry, we live in two presents. We live in the present of vital emergency. And of course, we live also happy and the beautiful moments and we enjoy the present as such. So, so yes, Nietzsche is right. The mm -hmm. remedy against the absurd is, uh, is the present time, but in two ways, the, the emergency of pain, calling us back to, to our duties and to life, and also the experience of the present. Like we are doing philosophy, we are, we are not, we are enjoying some some sort of a present time, and uh, it's not absurd. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Frederick, could you talk about the the philosophical exchanges between France and the United States today? Uh, you yourself, you you work on a lot on on care, and um, who or what gave you inspiration? Uh, regarding your your the, the issues you are dealing with you mean in the, in the in the american philosophy or yeah. yes well um, it's um it's it's difficult to to think in to me it's difficult to to think in in terms of um of a general um essences of a such and such philosophy of course i'm i'm very i'm i'm very um uh, not only sad but preoccupied with the divisions in philosophy today going in america through uh, what the, what some people call continental philosophy and other analytic philosophy and it's so it's all over in the world i think philosophy is made of uh, debates of course and uh, there should be debates on uh, uh, on every question and of course life is one question that unifies the philosophies in fact today for a very simple reason is that philosophies of mind and language and, and uh, well, in fact, they are vindicating a biological uh, importance, which is true. I mean, through the brain and the Chomsky's philosophy of language, as opposed to structural philosophy of language, was we have grammars in our brain, which is true, and so forth. So, through the question of life, I think we could we could all speak together. But of course, I have my dialogues, and I have my dialogues with people more easily, in a way, with people who share the same kind of vision of philosophy as going back to principles, not only accepting one principle and fighting over details, but fighting over the principles themselves. And I think analytic philosophy tends to uh, accept pr some principle and then develop some detail, which is good, okay? But we have to discuss the principles. Uh, what's the relationship, for example, between language and life? And uh, on the question of life and politics, of course, in the in the U.S., I discuss very much with people like uh, Judith Butler. I used to discuss with Arnold Davidson, a great uh, uh, publisher of Foucault in the in the States. I also discuss with such historians as uh, Dipesh Chakrabarty on the his global history and global uh, planetary history. So, uh, and I have friends, of course, in uh, in, in various domains. But um, but uh, I do think that. Th but of course, it. it I once said that Judith Butler was the greatest living French philosopher in a, in a way. So, uh, but there is this very dangerous political quarrel today. Yes. Over uh, what the uh, French uh, brought to the U.S. and what the U.S. brought back as, yes. in, a, as in a sort of ideological way, which is not my problem. My problem is, of course, philosophical. Yes, but but anyway, I, I would like you to to say something about this uh, this quarrel, this polemics, and uh, what do you think this of of this political and academic polemics on the supposed influence of the American Academy in France? Is it responsible for an ideological corruption? Is it imposing its culture, history, and conception of race? Because that's a lot of about, uh, about race 
this is the, the current uh, accusation. Could, could you say could you say something about uh, this? Uh, this well, I really think that uh, any philosophy and any science can become ideological. The, the distinction between ideology and knowledge is is true for for everybody. But for example, the question of race is not ideological. It's a very important philosophical and political question. It can become ideological if, and Canguilhem has a very good definition of ideology. It's the, when you take a, a local uh, truth as, as far as a general, uh, uh, and you export it and you, you tend to, to, to make of a local problem a general um, idea and ideology. But so there are there are some ideological uses of, for example, uh, local arguments of Derrida or Judith Butler or uh, whoever. And but the question of race, of course, as such, is not ideological. It can be dealt with scientifically, philosophically, justly, and also it can be dealt with ideologically. And of course, the the these questions are not. Um, are not immune against ideology and uh, of course the debates are so violent in the political space that they, they there is a contamination of course but it's, it's also true for the counter arguments they can be ideological too of course so the the, the race discourse can be massively ideological not not uh, but the, the of course the criticism of uh, of the of the of the of this uh, of these discourses can also be ideological and again, uh, we have to, to build the debates uh, in a, in a, as based on explicit principles and local problems, local mean, meaning uh, defined problems in a, in a very historic, very patient, historical and political uh, and, and, and theoretical way. But um, I will never say that the question of discrimination is ideological as such. Mm. And, uh, yes. I will, would you say would you say that uh, uh, in the French Academy uh, there is a, um, an ideological bias uh, today because you 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 feel well, there can be but I don't know what the French Academy is in general. No, but you feel the necessity of uh, you know distinguish uh, knowledge and ideology. So yes, but um, the French Academy as such is 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 um is very diverse yeah. and of course you 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 can find some um some tendencies uh, in a you, you can find some um some um we we have to draw some lines and and in, in the academy of course you have will have some people going over the the the, the limits and you can have uh, just as you can have fraud you can have insults you can have uh, well and and it has to be um uh defined and um, and um, and uh, and respected uh, but of course go generali generalizing is the sign of the ideology and people who say the french academy is such and such <laughs> are by definition in the ideology of course yeah, yeah. because the, the role of the academy is not to be unique of course it's to make some distinctions to distinguish between disciplines to distinguish between position to construct the controversies and of course just saying the french philosophy you know i, I i'm the director of a center of uh, the international center for the study of french philosophy but i don't know what french philosophy is i know what controversies in in moments that's the point i didn't say i say that moments to me are built with controversies with various positions on the problem. And of course, I don't know what French philosophy as such is. I know the difference between Sartre and Bergson. I don't know uh, the difference. Uh, and I know the difference also between uh, Sartre and Merleau-Ponty. Uh, they're both French. And, and, uh, and of course, I know the difference between Cavaillès and, uh, and Sartre. I even wrote a paper on Sartre and Cavaillès to show that there are main differences, but also some uh, common problems. But so I think we we are in a very dangerous period where um some some um, general accusations are 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 dealt are are, are um, assumed by people on both sides and um, we we have to build the controversies really with the uh, social sciences with history with philosophy very calmly 
and uh, and when people don't want to build a controversy, whatever the side, whatever their position, we cannot discuss, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I have a, uh, a very, well, <laughs> big question arriving uh, from Sarah Fadabini. Uh, I venture a bold question. How should one live life according to uh, vitalism critic? You say in French, là, vitalism critic, which is good. <laughs> Did you build or are you building a new ethics with uh, identifiable right. principles? I try. Yes, I try. I do try, of course. Um, I do try. It's um, it, it's. It's basically the, the core of it is not only polarity in general, uh, like for example, the bad and new sense, good sense of uh, revive. It's not even only political, but we need uh, just institutions. It, it's relational. And thanks for the question, because to me, it's the, the, the point I didn't have time to, to demonstrate or to develop. To me, the, 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 the central uh, ethical questions is uh, arising from human relationships. I wrote a paper called When Do Relationships Become Ethical? Quand les relations deviennent-elles morales? And to me, it's from the negativity between us that arise the ethics. We, there is a general negativity of life. Uh, for example, uh, of course, uh, death as such or illnesses. Then there is the political uh, violations. But between that and too often forgotten, there are the, the ethical uh, violence, which I call violation in, by the way, which is a concept I, I defend. And I think, yes, I do think that we have to fight against specific, specifically ethical negativities, which are, of course, vital. For example, I call violation a, a, a violence within a vital relationship, like uh, parental love or or uh, a care relationship, like, for example, when a a doctor rapes uh, his patient or her patient. And to me, this is typically a violation. And so, yes, the, I try to build a, an, an ethics of uh, relational life between human beings. And I start with the concept of violation, which to me is the negative uh, opposite to care, actually. My book called uh, Le Moment du Soin was mm -hmm. built on two parts, um, care and violation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Frédéric, could you say something about your role uh, uh, in the Comité Consultatif National d'Éthique? And because that, that could be a, a concrete example of what you are saying. And perhaps about, you said something about uh, the, the, the pandemics, the, 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 the decision, or that's not decision, of course, that's just suggestion for the, for poli for the politicians. But could you take, give us a, an example of the discussion you had about, uh, yes, these uh, ethical issues regarding uh, the pandemic? Dynamics. Well, yes, of course, I was very proud and happy to be in part a member of the French National Committee. It's been a seven year and a half already. I have made two mandates of four years each, almost completed. But uh, the pandemic, of course, is accelerating the second, uh, the end of my second uh, mandate. Um, it's a very interdisciplinary body and. Um, philosophy uh, is well represented in it but uh, i think that we missed uh, some other disciplines by the way but uh, of course i'm not imposing any view and I'm, I'm trying to to contribute by stating the problems also in a in a philosophical way one of the basic to continue with the former answer i would say that for example i try to think of bioethical questions not in terms of essences, what is life, what is uh, death, what is uh, birth, what is uh, uh, and so forth, but in terms of uh, relational uh, polarities. Uh, for example, when starts the violence against the patient, but also against the, 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 the carer, the caretaker, and, uh, and, and so forth. And it's sometimes very complicated, but, um, and, and so I think also that um, bioethics starts with a contradiction between ethics uh, because medic, medic, medicine is basically ethical in its in its purpose but of course it's not always ethical it has it can lead to power and it can contradict some other ethical principles so i think bioethics is a, is mostly 
a way to find a, a balance between con between ethical contradictions and in that sense it, it is obviously political to me bioethics is by essence a democratic exercise because it is a way to conciliate opposite ethics in a society which are sometimes very violent in their wars there is nothing more violent than the war of the gods than the war of the ethics one against the other ethical doctrines or whatever so it, there is nothing more violent than that of course and we know that very well and it's so not only true for religions of course it's true for religions but not only so so I, I view bioethics as a democratic exercise and uh, starting with vital questions, of course, and uh, I think the pandemic is uh, and public health is just a, a, a sort of it's it's an it's another it's another state degree of bioethics. We tend to think of bioethics in France mostly as the ethics of individual care and the ethics also of the use of biotechnological devices. And public health is something new. It's the it's the bioethics at the level of the collective, at the social level. But it's the same kind of problems. How do you conciliate uh, uh, prevention of death um, in the virus example and preserving liberties? How do you conciliate? Well, and that's 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 a point to me. Liberty, of course, is as vital as life in a way. But life comes first in a in a emergency situation and the emergency has to be defined of course democratically so yes i, I think um, to me it was a sort of um, of a gift to have this opportunity to be to be coherent in an institutional engagement and in a philosophical thinking i, I could also say that um, the question of engagement today, to me, is not only an individual question. It's um, it's a question within the institutions. You you had a president uh, up until January, last January, that confirmed that we have today to defend the institution. Institutions, to me, are vital inventions, just as medicine. We defend ourselves against dangers. They have to be criticized. So that's the, of course, vital critical vitalism is a is can be. Can, does lead has to lead to criticism of the institutions, but by defending the principles they are they are built on, not by destroying them. And so, of course, I, I find it coherent to be engaged in vital institutions in, in France, teaching institutions, and I'm part of the direction of the Ecole Normale and the ethical institutions such as um, the, eth the ethical committee and also the press, the media. So, well, maybe in the 60s, people were involved in being involved, being engaged in and to criticize the institutions because they were solid. Today, I think we have to be engaged within the institutions in a critical way, but also in a, in a, in a balanced way. I mean, critical also and vital. <laughs> and, and, and yes, I, I totally assume the kind of engagement I was lucky enough to be able to to develop to well and i hope to be still um, able to to act within in the in the years to come and, uh, and what we are talking in tonight is an institution it's an international institution with people <laughs> involved in it of course francois and all the all the people making it possible but of course it is an institution it's fragile it's vital mm -hmm. and the vital means also fragile so so we have to defend the discussion too Eric, thank you so much. Well, Francois, take, merci care. take care and see you soon. Take, take good care of yourself and uh, merci. And I, again, uh, New York, I want to see you soon. Sure. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Merci beaucoup.